Hi, everyone. I'm Rafe Needleman in San Francisco. Welcome to Reporters Roundtable. This week, we're talking about a disturbing turn of events in online privacy. Could you be forced to give up Facebook access as a condition of getting a new job? If you're applying for a job at the Maryland Department of Corrections, you may be asked to let an interviewer into your Facebook account to poke around and see what the social network looks like from your private perspective. Previously, interviewees were even asked to give up their passwords. At some colleges in the U.S., students have been required to friend coaches or compliance officers so their lives could be monitored in the social network. While employees and students can always protest these requests, if you want the job or the scholarship and you're asked for access to your private social network, you're likely to feel coerced to give in. These reported issues, and there are probably others, raise important questions around privacy and the delineation between our personal and our professional or public lives. On Wednesday, a bill to prevent employers from asking for passwords failed to win a vote in the House of Representatives. Facebook, though, has clearly said that it is against the terms of service to share your password with others and that the company will fight this trend in all the ways that it can. All right, so our guest today to discuss this really important issue is Bob Sullivan, a reporter at MSNBC who uh, reported first on the story and is the author of the online column, The Red Tape Chronicles. Bob, thanks so much for making the time. You bet. Happy to be here. So how did this happen? How did this whole thing come to light? Tell us the genesis of the story. Well, you know, like almost all privacy stories, it starts small and it just creeps. Um, for, for a long time now, we've known that employers very liberally use uh, Google to background employees. They look at social networks. They see what people have up there on their public sites. And so if you think about it, it's really not a large leap for a company that wants to know everything it can about an employee that they're going to invest a lot of money in to say, well, we see what you've got on your public Facebook site, but, but you, got, you got anything interesting behind your privacy wall, behind your password. And so uh, there's been a couple of scattered incidents. It's not widespread yet, but certainly very clear incidents of either on applications, companies asking for uh, individuals to give up their username and password, or, or as you mentioned, during job interviews saying, please log into your account so I can shoulder surf while you click around through your friends. And, and schools are requiring this kind of thing, either requiring that athletes connect with uh, compliance officers or they're using software to, to manually look at and inspect mm -hmm. all of their athletes posts so it's just becoming what, what always happens when there's data available employers and governments are going to want to try to look at it and use it to their advantage. So tell us about the, the case of Robert Collins which I, I think is the uh, watershed uh, incident here. Yeah a couple of years ago this started uh, he applied for a job he was a, actually a former employee was reapplying to, to work back at the Maryland Department of Corrections and they demanded that he give up his username and password. And, and it turned out that this was policy in Maryland at the time. They had asked for several thousand potential employees to give up their, their Facebook username and password. Uh, he did it because he wanted the job, but then he went to the ACLU, uh, which complained about it uh, and filed a lawsuit. And as a result of that, initially Maryland suspended that practice. Uh, and then when the heat was turned off, they slowly went back to something that was almost the same, but not quite. Now they just ask people to log into their accounts so they can see what's on their Facebook account. Now, the Maryland Department of Correction folks say they're doing this because they want to see if a potential guard, a potential prison guard, might have gang ties. Uh, but as you might imagine, uh, you know, lots of folks have problems with this. And, and while it's optional, well over 90% of the people who interviewed did give up their information. So it's not optional. When you're applying for a job, you just say yes when you need a job. Yeah, no kidding, especially in this economy. Uh, now, this is also affecting, as you said, uh, college applicants or, or sports uh, scholarship recipients. Is that right? Yeah, there's two different stories there. Uh, mm -hmm. One is I have actually there's a, a lawyer named Bradley Shear who's really been spearheading all of this. He's based in Washington, D.C. He's just a First Amendment lawyer, and he's been tracking this for a long time. And he has heard from parents who say when their kid went for their college interview, the interviewer said, can I see your Facebook page? Can I see inside your Facebook page? So nothing systematic on that front. But what is systematic is that athletes in big name sports programs, football players, basketball players, are being required all over the country to at a bare minimum to friend a compliance officer. So that means that someone at the school, some official, a coach or, or a, a, an assistant can actually see everything that an athlete posts to their friends, even if it's private. Uh, and they're also hiring these software companies that monitor 24-7 every tweet, every Facebook page, and again, even the ones that are only intended for a limited audience, and then sends alerts to coaches as to whether or not 
you know, if the word alcohol is used, for example, in a post. So, again, this makes a lot of people uncomfortable because the real world parallel is how would you feel about a coach having the right to walk into a, a student athlete's off campus apartment and say, okay, who's your friends? Now, and that. Really happening. To, to some extent, that happened, uh, was it a year or two ago, at a Pennsylvania school district where uh, school supplied laptops had s their webcams turned on by stealth. Yeah, you know, the yeah. light didn't come on, and uh, is that a, was that a similar case? And that was mon monitoring students basically in their bedrooms. It, it was, and interestingly, with that case, I think the the public outcry was unanimous that that was a horrible thing to do. This is a little bit more subtle, although I, I certainly think a case can be made. It's it's incredibly similar that if you can, you know, turn on a webcam in someone's apartment, what's the difference between that and and knowing what people are saying privately to their friends just because it happens to be using a technology device? And I, I, I keep coming back to this point. I write about privacy a lot, and I think we we just don't have the right uh, social rules in place for any of these circumstances. Uh, it's understandable that universities are scared because there's been lots of incidents that an athlete might tweet something really dumb and embarrass themselves. And in fact, there's a case recently in North Carolina where an athlete was tweeting about all these expensive dinners that he had, and he ended up it was clear he was violating uh, the professional amateur line. And, uh, and he ended up you know, having to leave school as a result of that, and the school's being investigated. So there's reasons that schools are interested in this. But as, uh, as lawyer Bradley Shear says, what schools are supposed to do is to teach kids how to do the right thing, not violate the First Amendment. Yeah, that sounds like the ends justifying the means argument, and it, which, I mean, I try not to get too political on the show and reveal my own biases, but this sounds, uh, to say it's Orwellian, I think, is just so blindingly obvious. Uh, to th to think that what we do in our private lives is uh, no longer basically, it's basically not private, that there is no private life. I mean, w which brings up the question, uh, in the modern world of work and education, what expectation should we have and should employers respect for our own privacy in the world of, of networking? Well, we really need to talk about this, and I think we are a decade behind in having this public conversation. You mentioned that the law uh, that was suggest, uh, proposed in the House of Representatives mm -hmm. failed this week, uh, and uh, I don't know who would be against forbidding employers to get uh, potential employees' usernames and passwords. That's obviously that's something that's a terrible idea. But I think that one of the reasons that it failed is because what would it really have accomplished? The, the line is not really clear. You can say you can't ask for a username and password, but what could they ask for? Could they ask, could they require you to friend someone? That's maybe not quite as dramatic and Orwellian a level, but it's close. There's already, uh, recently there was a study that showed that if you had analysts look at people's public Facebook pages, forget the private thing, using public posts that could actually create something that they loosely called a Facebook score, and that would predict whether or not a potential employee would be a good employee or not. And they ran a study, and it, they, they used posts to identify things like stick to and congeniality and all of that. And it actually turned out to be a pretty good predictor whether employees would be good workers. And so is that, is that, that's, again, if you're uh, going to invest a lot of money as a company, you're going to use every tool that you can. But that sure bugs the heck out of me that a company would use a tool that extensive and that invasive. But all of these, are, these things are on a continuum, and we don't know where the, the right spot on the continuum is yet. Well, let's go back to that, uh, the law for a little bit here, because uh, I can, my perspective on this, uh, which I, I'd like to hear your feedback on, is I can kind of understand why a law about requiring Facebook passwords, or about not allowing people to require Facebook passwords, et cetera, could be struck down, because one could argue that employment law already protects against the gathering of certain types of protected information. Uh, religion, medical status, mm -hmm. um, in some in, cases age. Yeah. Age. Uh, there yeah. are many things that you cannot ask in a job interview, and if you are made uh, got get access to somebody's personal uh, social network, that information will present itself to you by nature. You just go to the profile page. Uh, Almost inevitably, yeah. 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 So, so isn't this uh, information? already protected, and that's the argument that some of the senators are, and reps were already making, isn't it? Yeah, uh, you hear that argument a lot. We don't need a new law. The, the old laws, we just need to enforce them, and that could very well be true. Uh, I do think in the digital age, uh, again, these issues are squishy, mm -hmm. and when we find one that is just you know universally accepted, there's, there's no reason not to actually explicitly ban it, because, of course, when there's running room, 
uh, lawyers will find that running room. And again, you know, I, I, I can't stress the point enough that government agencies and companies will use all the data that they can get their hands on to make the best decisions that they can. That's, that's what organizations do. And so if it's not explicitly illegal, they'll do it. And, and by the way, a lot of this activity we're talking about is illegal in places like Europe. In Germany, you, an employer can't even look at a citizen's public Facebook page to make an, a hiring decision. So there are ways, to, there are societies that are attempting to, to do this in, in, uh, in ways that protect people's privacy more than in the U.S. We tend to be pretty hands-off with these privacy issues and hope the marketplace works them out. But I think it's hopeless to think that a, a free market is going to determine what's private and what's not in a way that's beneficial to consumers. Uh so the House Act uh, to prevent the collection of passwords um, didn't pass this time through. What is the future, you think, of legislation in, in this space? Well, there's been forever talk of an updated privacy law, kind of an omnibus bill, and, and it is time for that, although I understand every technologist who's listening to this right now cringes at the thought of members of Congress sitting down and making you know hard decisions about this very complex area, mm -hmm. uh, they need to get a lot of good advice when they do it. Um, but w what we don't have is is very clear rules that uh, that empower consumers to know what people know about them and what they can do about it. And and I think it would be a really good place to create. It's a civil right in the European Union, for example, the right to privacy. And here in the U.S., uh, our, our rights are, are are very vague, and almost always take a back seat to 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 technology expansion, to innovation, mm. and even in issues of computer security, the privacy of people comes last, and it's something we really need to talk more about. Well, with with that perspective, uh, I mean, certainly you must have uh, some thoughts on what a citizen can do when he or she is applying for a job or a scholarship or a grant or some kind of aid or something like that, knowing that uh, their information may be collected uh, from their public uh, or, or semi-public profiles on a social network, from insurance records, from, um, well, from any, anywhere. I mean, what is your advice for the, the, the person, the human being in the United States caught up in the middle of this, um, this confusion? Well, well I have some very specific advice right now for a group of people. Uh, there, there's really two kinds of people when it comes to privacy. Uh, there's people who say they care about privacy and then there's people who say they don't care about privacy and you know I have nothing to hide but the, the folks who say they care about privacy and that's about two-thirds of the US virtually none of them do anything about it so they might say they care about privacy but they'll still hand over their phone number to a grocery store to get one of those discount cards and they'll still use easy pass they don't do it they don't change their behavior at all and and that's a little bit naive I, I did a story with uh, professor Daniel Solov who wrote a, a great book called the digital person He's a professor at GW University, and the headline for the story was, um, Life isn't fair and companies aren't either. Mm. And one of the things that he finds with young people right now, college students, just after college students, is there's this sense, and even though you and I talk about it, and we know we shouldn't have pictures of people doing keg stands on our Facebook page, the truth is a lot of young people believe, you know, when I get... When I apply for a job, the human resources person, that's a person too. They've done all this. It's not going to be that big a deal. And while, while that might sound crazy during this conversation, that really is the mindset of a lot of younger people, that, that ultimately they're going to be treated fairly out there. And I, I'm here to promise them that they're not. When, especially in this economy, when somebody has 50 people applying for a job, if you're the one with the moderately embarrassing pictures on your Facebook page, you're going to be the first to go. And this is a harsh reality. Like Life isn't fair. Companies aren't either. And I think the basics are where we should really start. I, I, do, I get excited when people are appropriately paranoid about what might be construed about them in the future. And I can conjure up lots of scenarios about how someone might map your music tastes to your future employment prospects and, and all those things I think are going to happen. But today, what I want people to do is to be incredibly conservative about what they put online, what pictures they put online, what tweets they post. We see it every day. We saw it with Spike Lee this week. People accidentally tweet things that get them in a whole host of trouble in the future. So it's so easy to do. And if you're young and you don't have a solid job yet, Maybe it's time for you to drop off the grid for a while. It's, it's really important to realize that, that you're not going to be treated fairly when somebody sees something out of context in the future. If I may make a, uh, a leap of a comparison, you know, um, this has been, some people have talked about what you do online as the digital tattoo. And, you know, walking around in, in any city or in any place, uh, sometimes you see people with crazy tattoos on their neck. And you know that's never going away, at least not inexpensively. <laughs> 
But from my perspective, that's, those are the people who make life interesting. People are willing to take that risk, willing to be a little bit crazy in their youth. Uh, everybody grows up one way or the mm -hmm. other. Um, what you're proposing, I have to say, sounds like a uh, conservative, milk toast, uh, socially conservative, milk toast, boring world where everybody is so concerned about mm. looking good that they repress who they really are, and we end up with a horrible, boring world and a huge, thriving undercurrent of society that is totally off the grid and unknown. And I'm very sorry to do that, but I, <laughs> I, I think it's the best advice I could give someone right now. Uh, and I, I would, of course, never want to enforce a boring world on people, but a, a boring virtual world, I think that's right. I think that right now we just don't know what things are going to look like in 2020. Mm. We, we, we don't know, I mean, I, and I, I, I hinted at this already, but I know these kinds of projects are already underway. If somebody can map the kind of music you download to your likelihood that you'll show up late for work in the future, they're going to do it. And employment background companies are going to sell that. It's going to be very valuable to future employers. So, you know, frankly, the footprints that you leave online, you just don't know how they're, how they're going to cost you in the future. And so you're best off not having them or uh, having as few as you can. What, what musical taste should we put into our Facebook profiles to ensure ourselves a better job history in the future? Well, see, that, that's actually a, 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 that's a good point. Credit scores and credit reports are a really good uh, lesson for what we're talking about right now. The credit score formula is one of the great mysteries of life in America. We all have hints as to what it is, but it's a secret sauce like fried chicken. No one really knows what it is, and it has to be secret because if it weren't secret, then people would game it. And all of these things that I'm talking about with privacy, what kinds of things might make you a future good employee, we're not going to know what they are. So you won't know if saying that you like the Beatles is good or bad for you. No one will be able to tell you that. And the minute that you know, it will no longer be relevant because the companies will stop selling it. That's the merry-go-round that we're caught in here. Hey, what does Facebook say on this whole topic? They can't be silent on this. No. When I first approached them, they, they really didn't know how to respond. We spent about a week going back and forth, and then they gave me uh, a, just a statement. That, and frankly, they wouldn't give me a, an official statement. They just pointed me toward their terms of service, which quite clearly imply that you're not allowed either to give your username and password to someone or that you're not allowed to let someone else watch while you surf your account. Uh, I, I think they didn't realize how extensive it was, and then there was a, a three or four weeks of, of stories. And so recently, they published a blog post, which was quite clear, where they said, "No giving out your Facebook passwords." And in fact, uh, we stand ready now to to do everything we can, even legal action, to stop employers from doing this. It's a real threat to Facebook's business model mm -hmm. if they get a sense that these people are abusing the service in this way. And for the employers out there, I, I'd like to also touch on uh, the fact of what can happen to you as an employer, as a hiring person, yeah. if you end up with access to somebody's private data. Uh, Bob, you want to talk about the exposure that this opens up to employers? Oh, I, I can't stress enough what can of worms you're opening up if you're an employer. Just for starters, first of all, just acquiring people's usernames and passwords. We all know that they're probably using those usernames and passwords at other places. And immediately, you're probably subject to the Federal Trade Commission safeguard rules. So you now have private data. You have to take care of it. And if you don't, you're liable for what happens to it. So if you're an employer and you now have a cabinet uh, employment file full of people's passwords, inevitably someone's going to steal it, and you're going to be in a lot of trouble, and you might have to pay for it. So there's a lot of money. Additionally, especially when it comes to colleges, what you find out once you start rooting around people's private information, you start rooting around their Facebook page. Um, you know, the example that I was told again and again with Yardley Love and the terrible murder incident down in, uh, in Virginia, uh, what if the school's athletic compliance officer had access to some tweets or Facebook posts that might have hinted that an event like that was going to occur and didn't stop it? Wouldn't they incur incredible additional liability for not stop, not intervening. And, and that the more that you have access to, the more liability that you have. And as an employer, I wouldn't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole. Tell me about these compliance officers. What's the job description, and, and how do we get a job like that? <laughs> it, <laughs> well, sounds, these, it sounds a great job for a voyeur or uh, uh, I don't know. But. You know, the, uh, student athletes, their lives are very hard right now, and they have a million rules to follow. And as a result, in order to keep these programs going, they're up guys, men and women with clipboards who run around making sure that they are wearing the right tennis shoes, that they're not accidentally getting their picture taken with a car dealer uh, who they might use it as an, in, the, in an advertisement. This, it's actually, a, being a student athlete can be, can be pretty difficult. So there are, I mean, we, you know, we used to hear about morals clauses in, in sports and uh, mm -hmm. for, for TV actors and things like movie actors. Uh, what is the state of the, the moral monitoring of uh, public and semi-public employees right now in, in the social sphere? 
Uh, you know, I just don't think that there is one. I, I really think this this story, which, which again, we know this has been going on for at least a couple of years. So it's not as if this is a brand new thing. It's just come to light now. We barely scratched the surface of talking about it. And as a result, we have no social mores. I ultimately hope that's what takes over here. I ultimately hope that, you know, we all reacted to this idea that a school would turn a webcam on people's homes. There wasn't anyone who thought that was a good idea. So I think almost all school districts now would, would not do that. Or if one did it, it would be a rogue superintendent. I hope that's the kind of thing that happens with this Facebook password, Facebook password situation. And by the way, we didn't even mention there was a case in Minnesota of a 12-year-old student who allegedly was having a spat with a teacher mm -hmm. and was hauled into the principal's office with a uh, sheriff's marshal there who had a sidearm, actually. And they demanded that she give up her Facebook password so that they could see what else she was saying about the teacher, essentially. So, so this kind of thing is happening all around the country. And again, who's a 12-year-old to say no to the principal and demand like that? But, but I'm hoping that socially we decide, oh, this, is, this is just a step too far. This is like looking in someone's diary, which we would never do, and, and let's just cut it out. We need compliance, compliance officers. <laughs> That's what we need. All right, what's coming up for you? What's next in, in this uh, developing story? Well, I write about privacy all the time, and, and uh, you probably have already gotten a sense of my drumbeat here, which is there's, there's data that's collected now about us in so many different ways, collected every time we make a phone call, every time we use an easy pass, every time we get onto a subway or use public transit, and all that data is, is, is being used in, in incredible ways and meaningful ways, in some ways, uh, you know, great ways for marketers, uh, great ways for us to understand ourselves, but consumers are last in the bottom. Of, of having access to that data and, and right to, to, to control that data. And it's, it's really time that people stood up and said enough is enough. That data is valuable. It's my property, and I should get to decide what, what happens to it. Great. Bob, thanks very much. Bob Sullivan is the uh, writer of the Red Tape Chronicles over at MSNBC. If you care about this stuff, and you should, you should check that out. Bob, thanks for your time. Thank you.